So without further ado, uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Ruby Latif, and Ruby's project. Uh, the title of her project is "Bias in News Media Coverage of Female Politicians." Is in, is uh, is inconsequential, and here is why. Okay, so thank you so much. <laughs> The applause before the presentation, right? That's even better. My topic, actually, research topic has changed a few times, so I will actually be talking about something a little bit different, but it will relate to my original research question. So my research question is, do masculine media narratives or media discourse influence marginalized women's decisions to run for political office? When I'm talking about marginalized women, I'm specifically looking at women like Mitzi Hunter, who happens to be an Ontario cabinet minister. I'm looking at people like Menon Perleau. She's a past federal MP from Montclom. And people like Jamie Lee Hamilton, who happens to be the first transgender person to run for municipal politics in BC. But that word marginalized will definitely change and will probably encompass more the more research I do. So my theoretical framework for this presentation focuses on gender mediation thesis. Really, there's two premises to this, and the first premise is really focuses on how the news constructs gender into a masculine discourse. The second point focuses on how males dominate the position of power in the news. So basically, they're the gatekeepers of the media, and they set the standards of journalistic practice. So when you're focusing on gender mediation thesis, we need to also look at schemas. And gender schema theory, simply put, because it's all about simplicity today, the theory really explains how people acquire and retain stereotypical information about the world around them. And this is really important in politics, because politics has actually been constructed in a male dominion or a male domain. So in politics, political leadership, is it's necessary to really understand what political leadership is and how that is portrayed in gender roles. So women and men are represented differently. Gender roles are represented differently. So characteristics like assertiveness and independence are synonymous with maleness and warmth and compassion are associated with femaleness. So the past research in this area really focuses on past feminist researchers in media. They're really focused on how gender is socially constructed. And what I'm mostly interested in is the new wave of researchers, and they're really looking at women politicians are actually receiving differential media coverage. So it's given, it's happening, we understand it. But what is the most interesting aspect of this is that women are not victims of the stereotyping. They're actually playing very important roles in how gender mediation occurs. So my interest in this topic actually occurred in 2001. So I have a, I have a vast experience within politics. I've been working in politics for over 15 years. In 2001, I took my first political job working for Brenda Chamberlain, who's an MP. And I brought in a tray of cookies my first day trying to suck up to the boss, right? <laughs> So she said to me, Ruby, I can't eat those cookies. If I gain another five pounds, the media's gonna have a field day with me. I stepped back and said, whoa, what does she mean by that? 19-year-old naive person really didn't really know what I was talking about, so I let it go. Fast forward 2013, I left politics. This time Premier Wynne is now elected and I'm just transiting out of my job from Queen's Park. And there's a discussion about Premier Wynne's wardrobe and they're talking about how Premier Wynne is now dressing more girly, and the Sun Media is having a field day with this, Metro Morning comes out and says, hey, look, um, why are we having this conversation? We should really be having a conversation about her, um, about her competencies. Interestingly enough, I love this quote. It basically says, just a late person said, does the PM's pants cut adequately emphasize his thunder? So you can see how ridiculous this conversation is. Fast forward 2016, we're talking about Hillary Clinton. There's a research project that just came out. The researcher, Harp, basically says that we are looking at gender mediation. It's happening. However, there's improvements. We're still focused on, um, we're still focused on feminist stereotypical things. There's a great quote here. I'm not going to read it out because I'm going to be short on time soon. 
my research is going to actually look at two things. Quantitative data, I'm going to do a content analysis. I'm also looking at, sorry, quantitative data, doing a content analysis of um, TV. And I'm also doing qualitative data, interviews with marginalized candidates. And basically, this is important to me because the last three months, I've been doing a lot of research. As you can see, in 2001, you know, this topic had come about. In 2016, we're still having this conversation. PM uh, Trudeau is talking about this. He wants more elected women. How do I help? Because we're all practitioners. My goal is to try to figure out how to, to get more marginalized women elected, and so hopefully my research will help. And if you're interested to talk to me more, that's my contact information. Thank you. So first of all, I just want to I just want to say um, how happy I am to be at Royal Roads. I really want to thank all of you in the room and all of you with Royal Roads for the experience that I've had. I'm so glad that I chose Royal Roads, and I'm so glad that you chose me. And I'm so happy with the professors that we've had. It's just been an absolutely amazing adventure. Uh, Simon and Ken last summer, and Marilyn in between, and, and Matt and Jacqueline, who is a stats yoga, two words I had never thought I'd ever use at the same time. And great support from Jennifer and, and Carol, and in such an incredible campus. And I would say, if we hadn't gone to Calgary, we would not have fully appreciated how lucky we are to be here. <laughs> Really. <laughs> and the other thing I want to tell you is that everybody cares, and I've been to lots of universities and lots of development programs, and it's amazing how the brand is actually executed. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Habitat or the library, security guards pick a story. Everybody cares, and they're trying to give you this amazing experience. So I just didn't want to get up here and not give that opportunity to say that, because I'll probably never get, never get another chance. It's just been amazing to be here. And I'm with an amazing Calgary cohort, and uh, I'm surrounded by beautiful and wonderful, brilliant people, and so to that. OK, let's talk about wisdom. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm interested in defining or redefining wisdom in business and what that really means and what it really looks like. So it's things like caring more about the bottom line. It's things like leading the organization and the employees in a way that uh, really employs discernment about what really matters, not just to the company and the bottom line, but to the community that we're a part of, to the customers that we have, to our employees, to the whole organization, to our shareholders, from a much bigger picture perspective. Oh, there, we're working good. So why does it matter? Well, I think it matters because certainly from a strategic perspective, we now make decisions that are much more global than they used to be. And so I think that piece is really important to think about. I also think the speed of change and technology and the resulting disruptions make wisdom more necessary within an organization. And so in my business, I'm in banking. We think about the fintechs and what that's doing to the business that we're in, or even if as simple as Uber, right? Um, the change in our workforce is also interesting. The, the younger generation, and I've done quite a bit of work or been, been to several different conferences that have talked about the research that they've done with millennials. And the millennials want something different. They want to work for a company that matters. And I think that might be a wise corporation. And there's also what I would say is intentional wisdom transfer. So I really think it's important that organ as an organization that we intentionally transfer wisdom. And I do think that that will result in lots of benefits to an organization from a bottom line perspective, right? And my experience, which really drove me into this, is most organizations, well, I think every organization I've ever worked for, I think I've been with six of them now, um, I've been working for over 30 years, we do this cycle stuff, you know? And even if you're new to the organization, if you dig back into some of the material that, you know, sometimes you trip over like minutes of, you know, executive meetings, things like that, it's shocking how often you see the same topics come up. And it's amazing how we don't really take the time to look at what's come before. And we really, I think, don't even drive that in business. You know, the, the big rage now is you come into a new business, you have 90 days, by God, 90 days, make a difference, put your mark on it. There's not a lot of wisdom in that, right? So I, that's what got me here. And one more. Oh, that's me? OK. My research questions, um, the definition or the refinement of the definition of wisdom in a business context, in a profitable business context, so not a not-for-profit, but a profit. 
I'd like to identify the practices and processes that um, could be put in place to facilitate wisdom, intentional wisdom, transfer at an executive senior management level. And then I want to also do the same thing at the younger level. So what can we do to nurture and enhance wisdom development for millennials? And I'm, you know, there's kind of in the research, there's kind of um, not schools, but sort of two broad thoughts. One is that wisdom is really related to age, and one is that it's not. And I'm in that camp, so I know lots of really young, brilliant, wise people, and I know lots of people that are older than aren't as brilliant and wise. So I think that they exist for both. So I want to get that the two pieces. There is some measurement tools, uh, so I might actually be able to use some quants uh, in, in uh, some of this. There's, there's actually about 10. These are sort of the top three, uh, the self-assessed wisdom scale, the three-dimensional wisdom scale. The Berlin wisdom paradigm is actually more of an interview model as opposed to uh, a, a self-assessed survey, but I'd like to use some of those tools. There's lots of theory and, and models and frameworks that are out there, so I'm still researching um, what pieces that I could weave into my work. Uh, also, um, interesting conversations about data versus knowledge versus information versus wisdom. Uh, also, some interesting models that are out there that I'd like to look at. And then also, I think there's a bit of a foundational theory, perhaps, that could weave in. So I think, I don't know this, but I think organizational culture might be key to wisdom transfer. So I think the organizational culture is kind of the fishbowl we swim in. And I think that that fishbowl water has to be supportive of wisdom and wisdom transfer for that to actually happen. I don't know that, but I suspect that'll weave in. Also, leadership. Um, my uh, experience of leadership development is that um, we send people to amazing leadership development programs. The company I work for does it as well, and I've been to a number of different ones over the years. I've been with different companies. We do super leadership work, and then we send people back to the organization, and we start saying perform, and we start measuring their performance with things like Hewitt surveys or 360s or whatever, which actually drives them away from wisdom and drives them away from leadership. And so maybe the next piece is possibly uh, being able to, um, oh, I'm going to get the hook, um, is possibly being able to open that next window into, into wisdom. I'm almost done, Simon, I promise, I promise, I promise. Methodology, just mixed methods, inductive thematic analysis, in-depth interviews with the two different cohorts I talked about, identification of samples by referral. Um, what do I hope to find? I actually hope that at some point I can come up with a model that will, will help us figure out uh, to, or how to use to develop wisdom, culture wisdom, transfer wisdom, I'm not sure the right word yet, in organizations. And then if I really do figure it out, I'll do a journal entry, because I, I promised I would do a journal entry. And if I dream really big, I would write a book. But Matt also told me that even if you don't find something, it's still interesting and still results, but nobody's going to buy a book about that. So, um, so I hope to find something. That's it. Third speaker this afternoon is Melissa Rothwell, and Melissa will be uh, presenting on her, uh, her project on social promotion in education. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, I am Melissa Rothwell. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about promotion policies, specifically in Alberta, and specifically social promotion. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about it, the why I want to conduct the research, my theoretical framework, my methodology, and the goals for my future. OK, so social promotion is also known as the no-fail policy, as well as the no-zero policy. It's found all throughout Canada, but we have different names for it. So what is it? It is to pass a grade between K to 8 without any academic merit. Mm, that's a kind of strong saying. So essentially, it is you didn't get enough of the curriculum in order to pass with your students, but we're going to push you ahead anyways. Okay. Who makes those decisions for the kids? Not the child. It, is, it starts at the administration level, then it goes to the teachers and the parents. So there's the pros and the cons, the supporters and the critics. Okay. Essentially, it costs about $6,000 per grade per child in the province of Alberta to attend primary school per grade, right? So if a child fails, that means the province will have to pay $12,000 per grade for that one child. So why would you do it? Well, or why wouldn't you do it, I should say? 
Um, there's learning through, the supporters believe that there's learning through um, interaction with their peers. It's a very social constructionist view that, you know, even if we push them ahead, they'll be able to learn from others. Uh, people that are against it um, believe that they won't have the opportunity to learn the old material, so how will they grasp the new material? So, why do I want to do this? Because I'm an educator, because I'm a parent. I want to do it because Specifically when I was working at the college, as a counselor and wellness advisor, I was noticing that students who did not have a mental illness were developing depression and anxiety. They were developing it because for the first time in their life, they failed. For the first time in their life, they were told they weren't good enough. For the first time in their life, it was recognized that they couldn't read. So they developed these mental illnesses. Um, I want to improve the policy and how it's implemented. I don't necessarily believe that the policy itself is flawed, but it gets lost in translation. So I want to look at that. Um, I, I, as a curriculum developer, don't know how to develop curriculum anymore because I don't know what level my college students are going to be when they come through my doors. So how am I going to provide them with the best education if I don't know what education they have? Um, the quality of education is something I care about. I went through the education system. I'm standing here because of what I learned in the past. And it is a basic human right. It's a basic human right for everyone to have education. But when you look at the human rights legislation, it actually says the implementation of a good quality education. Are we providing our students the proper education if we're not implementing it properly? So, I'm going to use um, education policy theory, and that was just finally firmed last night at 9 p.m. as I was typing this out. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to focus on the development of the policy at both the provincial and the federal level. Okay? Um, the government, the feds can say we're going to do these policies in each province, but how is it created for each provincial government? How is it implemented? Every time there's an election, things change. So we're going to look at that. Um, explore the forces that create the policy. So who's making these policies? Is it someone who's an educator? Someone who's actually sitting there working with grade five students who are at a grade one level? Um, the, po the theoretic th th framework will also look at the context. So the specific policy why it was created, um, refer to the policy itself, and if the policy requires immediate action. Okay, so do, is my research why it should be there? Like, is it happening because it needs to be done? The consequences. So if I go and change this, what's going to happen? Is anything going to happen? I've decided to do a discourse analysis because I want to look at the language of the policy. If the policy is provincial, why is every institution, every school division implementing it differently? Is it because it's written differently? that people don't understand it properly, what's going on there? So I'm going to do a discourse analysis. I'm going to start off with doing questionnaires with teachers and administrators. So how do they implement it? What decisions do they utilize? And from that questionnaire and the results, I'm going to create an interview process where I'm going to interview um, administrators and teachers and um, see how they make the decisions for the outcome of the student. So my goal is to prove the Education Retention Policy Program in Alberta. I'm thinking small first. Let's start provincial, then we'll go federal. Um, to help administrators and teachers and parents make informed decisions. You can come to me and say, I'm going to push, or I'm going to socially promote your child. Do you agree with that? I don't know what social promotion is. I Google it, I don't get all the information I need. So I need to make sure that everyone is informed. I want to improve the long term success of students when they make it to college and university, I don't want them to have anxiety because they don't know how to write a paper. Okay? Um, and I just want to make a change in our education system overall. And that's it for me. Our fourth speaker uh, this afternoon is Weir Milne, and Weir is going to be talking about his project uh, on Ontario's mandatory mediation program and his uh, uh, institutional eth ethnographic approach. Hi. Life was pretty good until the car accident. 
all you wanted was an apology to get your rehab paid for. You talked to the person after the accident that hit your car, seemed to be a nice enough person. Unfortunately, you couldn't get your rehab bills paid for, so you went to a lawyer. Two years later, thousands of dollars later, your lawyer tells you you have to go to a mediation. What's that? He tells you that you have to show up in a meeting with the other side to see if you can get the case settled. You show up. Before you go, your lawyer tells you to keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything because you don't understand the process. You will say something that hurts your case. You walk into the room and the mediator tells you that this is all about risk analysis. Litigation is expensive. You want to settle today. The insurance company's lawyer tells you that you're a fraud. There's nothing wrong with you. And that if you lose your lawsuit, they're going to take your house. The mediator says it's time to split up. Everybody goes to a caucus. You sit in a dimly lit room with no windows with your lawyer for the balance of the day, waiting for the mediator to come in and tell you what the insurance company is prepared to offer for your case. Each time you get an offer, you respond. And so goes the process until the mediator comes in and says, they say they're not going to pay you any more money. What do you want to do, take it or leave it? Your lawyer says, we can't afford to go to trial. It's going to cost thousands of dollars. We don't know what's going to happen. At the end of the day, you sign the papers and go home. Nobody's asked you what you want. Welcome to Ontario's mandatory mediation program. As originally envisaged, the program was designed to give parties the opportunity to communicate with one another and solve their legal disputes according to their own precepts of justice and fairness. As a mediator of 16 years and a lawyer of 36 years, I contend that this is not occurring. I contend that the mandatory mediation program is now controlled by powerful interests who debate and argue over money while the parties who are actually involved in the lawsuit are ignored, marginalized, and completely shut out of the process in some cases. That is why I'm doing my dissertation. That is why I came to Royal Roads. The way I propose to crack this nut and to bring this to the attention of the public is to conduct an institutional ethnography. It will allow me not only to say what is going on, but how and why. As you may know, inst institutional ethnography has three principal components to its methodology. The first is participant observation. As a mediator who has been involved in the program, I have a unique position to see how the program operates every day. The second is interviews. Unlike most um, qualitative method, uh, interview processes, institutional ethnography concentrates on documentation, what the interviewees can tell you about the documents that are prepared during the course of the litigation. The third component is a unique interpretation of documentation, text-mediated documentation, as Dorothy Smith refers to it. At the end of my dissertation, I hope to bring the results to the attention of the Attorney General's office, hopefully to get some changes there. But as uh, I also want to bring it to the attention of the men and women I work with every day so that they can change their practices. The system doesn't have to be scrapped. It just needs to be changed to become more inclusive for the parties that were originally designed to service. Thank you. Our last presenter this afternoon is uh, Cyprian Ojem, and Cyprian's going to be talking about uh, assessing CSR investments by multinational resource corps in Nigeria.
Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. My topic uh, is on assessing CSR investments by multinational resource corporations in Nigeria. And I'm taking a close look at what's happening in the Niger Delta today. I will go through a series of items during this uh, program. Uh, the background of my study is in, on Nigeria, as I think a, a good number of us may uh, know about Nigeria, we have the issue of Nigeria being a mono economy, whereby most of the income of Nigeria is coming from oil, 70% plus. And we have most of the oil companies in Nigeria, Shell, Total, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Tezaco, Eni, Ajib, and all the rest of them operating in the country with a lot of issues of environmental degradation, sustainable development issues, and all the rest. Uh, the problem today is there have been recent studies that have correlated inequalities in the communities with actions of these companies. And some of those actions are supposed to be positive actions, which the companies look at as corporate social responsibility actions. But there are researches that are correlating these actions to the conflicts in the communities. Why? There are conflicts arising from supposedly good actions. And these conflicts are not just conflicts, they are leading into crisis and to killings, militancy, and all the rest. So for the purpose of my research, I decided to go into uh, discovering what are the global standards for CSR. How, what does world organizations see as CSR? Different from what the companies see as CSR and different from what the communities see as CSR. So this, this, uh, this uh, research is going to look at what world organizations see as valid CSR investment. People, uh, organizations like the European Foundation for Quality Management, the International Financial uh, Finance Corporation, which is an arm of the World Bank. Then I'll also look at the perspective of the NGOs. Fortunately, today, I work in a place where I have access to the world NGOs, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, Amnesty International, and all the rest of those kind of you know, high-level NGOs. Where I work in a place where we can relate with them. And their perspective is quite different. So I'm going to look at the perspective of the NGOs. They are like the watchdogs today. So what are they saying? World Bank, what's World Bank saying? EPK is an association of that governs the CSR investments of oil companies. So I've also um, subscribed to them, to that membership, to enable me to have an idea of what they look at. Then finally, the CDA. CDA is a very large organization that studies uh, what is happening between extractive industry and their communities world over. And they are very, very uh, well respected. You discover that each of these organizations have their own idea of what CSR should be. For instance, the European Foundation for Quality Management, they, are, they have three basic um, measures for what you can call CSR. One, it has to be economically responsible. It has to be socially responsible and environmentally suspect, uh, responsible. If otherwise, even if you build a school, a hospital, a bridge, they will not consider it as CSR, except it matches this criteria. It must comply to sustainable development ideals, which says that development must, while trying to meet the needs of today, it must attend to the needs of tomorrow. It must make sure that people, tomorrow's people, as our children and children's children, will not be disadvantaged because of what they're doing today. So when you, when you put oil in the water, of course, it's not only us, but our children that we survived. The World Business Council also has their own ideas, as well as the IFC. Now, in the academic perspective, we have scholars who have also looked into uh, what CSR should be. And for people like Mark Williams and Shegel, 2001, the important thing there is that it must contribute to social good. Every company must contribute to social good in one way or the other. And there are other um, academias who have also learned their, their thinking in this regard, which will 
show up in my literature review. The purpose of my study generally is to contribute to the improved CSR investments by multinational resource corporations. When I finish my work, I should have made a contribution to improvement of CSR investment strategies. And my research questions will definitely go in that, in that direction. What is the scale and the scope of CSR investments by international oil companies in Niger Delta? Today, there is an argument. The government does not believe the companies. The company does not believe the government. The government does not believe the communities. The communities don't believe the companies. <laughs> so there is an argument. Why? I discovered during the course of preparing for my research, there is a gap. That gap is that there is no inventory showing this is what has been done for the past 20, 30 years. So when the company say we are spending, we are spent $5 billion, the community say, where is the $5 billion? Is it this monopump you built here that's $5 billion? So there is a confusion. My purpose of my research is to go and find out exactly what and what has been done within this period. To do that, I will employ historical research. I'll find out what happened from, the, from 1958 up to date. And then I will do document analysis to see what the companies have done using their brochures, their CSRO documents, and all the rest. Then I will go into field survey to find out exactly what has happened. Then I will come back with project evaluation and my recommendations. My positionality is very clear. I have worked in the oil company for 20 years. And as, a function, as, a, as an operator of the oil company, I have spearheaded CSRO investments in many communities. As a matter of fact, in 2013, I was Deputy General Manager for Sustainable Development when my company won the leader of CSRO in Nigeria. So that's my positionality. And various companies will benefit from this research, as well as government and academia. Of course, my study is a little bit limited, uh, has some constraints because of my positionality. I also come from one of the oil, oil producing communities. So this is going to be a little bit dicey, but I have tried to find a way to achieve this research. Thank you very much.